changing our behavior is the single most important step we can take to preventing and reversing chronic disease. Welcome to the Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman, and that's pharmacy with an F, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, a place for conversations that matter. And today's conversation matters to you if you care about what you eat and if you're confused about nutrition because our guest is one of the most knowledgeable guys in the space of health and nutrition. He's my go-to guy when I'm confused about something. I go see what he thinks before I figure out what I think. His name is Dr. Chris Kresser. He's an extraordinary guy. He's my friend. He's my teacher, inspiration, and he's the guy I go to when I get sick because I want to know what to do. So he's the co-director of the California Center for Functional Medicine. He's the founder of the Cresser Institute. He's creator of chriscresser.com, which is my go-to place for nutrition information. He's a New York Times bestselling author of The Paleo Cure and Unconventional Medicine, which is essentially about functional medicine, which is what we both do. He's one of the most respected clinicians and educators in the field of functional medicine and ancestral health and has trained over 1,500 clinicians and health coaches in his unique approach. We're going to talk about that more later. He was named one of the most 100 influential people on health and fitness by Greatest and has appeared as a featured guest on Dr. Oz, Fox and Friends, lots of other places. He lives in Berkeley, California with his wife and his daughter, who I met both of them, and they're very sweet and daughter very cute. So welcome, Chris. Pleasure to be here, Mark. As okay, always. you and I go way back, yes. and we met at an event many years ago and literally been fast buddies ever since and have a mind meld on a lot of things and have uh, talked about all sorts of issues. And today we're gonna cover a lot of ground, but I wanna start with the news headline, which came up in my inbox today, which was that meat kills. Oh, Meat kills. Yeah. It was a study published in the British Medical Journal or BMJ entitled Association of Changes in Red Meat Consumption with Total and Cause-Specific Mortality in US Women and Men based on two studies that are massive studies that have been going on for decades called the Nurses' Health Study and the Physicians' Health Study. And these studies looked at populations over many, many years and tracked what they ate and their habits and their lifestyle and tried to see if that was correlated with any bad outcomes. Now, it was fascinating when I read the report on this study that the authors well said, well, you know, this can't prove cause and effect, but it should make everybody eat less meat and eat more plant-based proteins. So it just seems completely contradictory. And I want to get into the story of meat because we have this incredible dichotomy. You think Republicans and Democrats are uh, <laughs> at odds with each other? Yeah. Well, it's this really strange polarization in the food wars between vegans and the paleo folks and everybody else in between. And it's unfortunate because the truth is we mostly agree on everything except for a few little fine points. And that's why I sort of jokingly at this event where I think we actually met, I came up with the idea of Pegan, yeah. which was a total joke because I was sitting on a panel with a paleo doc and a vegan doc and they were fighting. And I'm like, you guys, come on, if you're paleo, you're vegan, I must be Pegan. So let's get real here about what we agree on. And part of the reason, reason for the confusion, which you have extensively written about is the problem with research. And when you hear a headline like this, and I'm sure people are going to have heard this headline in the news that meat kills, it doesn't actually represent what the science says. So the consumer's confused, the media's confused, doctors get confused, and everybody's confused, but it's not so confusing. And you shed light on why it's not so confusing. So let's start with, at first, why we have problems with these studies and why we're so confused. And then we'll get into the real data on meat. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, as you pointed out, this study, along with many others like it, I mean, I could set my watch by how <laughs> often these studies come out claiming to show that meat increases the risk of death. We see it all the time. My email box blows up, social media blows yeah. up. But and, you said. Yeah, you said. And, and, you know, now at this point, I'm just linking to some articles I've written that has everything yeah, there. Not this. even bothering to write anymore because <laughs> it's the same response every single time. Yeah. And the response is, as you pointed out, when you do a large observational study, you're just showing two factors that are occurring together. You're not demonstrating a causal relationship that one factor is causing another factor. And, you know, there are many different examples of this. There, there's one blog um, name. I think the guy's name is Tyler. I can't remember his last name, but it's called Spurious Correlations. Yes. And yeah. he has basically collected a bunch of correlations that have nothing, clearly nothing yep. to do with one another. Like 
uh, the margarine consumption is like 99.7% correlated with the divorce rate in Maine. <laughs> Or Maybe it's connected because you know, you know trans <laughs> yeah, fats. I may would get a divorce probably brain. If, if my wife was feeding me margarine. She you, well, <laughs> yeah. Honestly, my mother used to give me Fleischmann's margarine when I was a kid because that was the seventies, and Tang and Fleischmann's margarine were the right. future foods, right? <laughs> right. So it's it's really tempting to assume that variables are cor- are causally related when they're not, and um, it's not a safe assumption, especially with the case of red meat, because um, of something called the healthy user bias or the unhealthy user bias, depending on how you look at it. So for decades, we've been told that red meat is not a healthy food. And so people who on average in studies, if you're looking at the general population, people who tend to eat more red meat also tend to engage in more behaviors that are perceived as unhealthy. Right. So they might smoke more, they might drink more, they eat fewer fruits and vegetables. They don't, they're not as physically active. They're not as well Smoke educated, more. they're lower income, which has nothing to do with their value as a person, but yeah. th- these are correlated with lower, you know, higher risk of death, mm-hmm. um, more strongly than any nutritional factor. And, you know, they probably have an, uh, their microbiome is probably not as healthy because they eat lots of processed and refined food. Right. And researchers try to control for some of these uh, confounding factors, but there's no way that they can ever control for all of them. Another huge problem with nutritional epidemiology is the way that data are collected. <laughs> so yeah. most people are shocked when they learn how just how ridiculous this is. Yeah. But they use these assessments called food frequency questionnaires or yeah. other what are known as memory-based assessments or memory-based measures. So like so, what did you have for lunch yeah. last Thursday? What or? did you have for lunch last Thursday? How many servings of red meat did you eat four weeks ago, Mark? Oh, yeah, I mean, well. You and I think about food probably more, more than six, <laughs> more, five servings. And you and I think about food more than probably just about anybody, you know. So I can tell you what I ate yesterday, remember. but that's about it. <laughs> right, right. So, um, and, and, and to illustrate this, some researchers did an analysis of the nurse's health data, which which is what these new studies were based on. That meat the kills, nurse's right. health study, the meat kills. And it's not like, because it was a 10% increase in risk. We'll we're going to get, get into that. that. Yeah, yeah, we're going to get into that. So they did an analysis of these memory-based assessments, and they found that the average, ca- that uh, for the majority of people, 67% of people in these studies reported a calorie intake that was so low that not even an elderly, frail, bedridden woman could survive on it. That's right. So these are obese Overweight people, they're reporting a a starvation level calorie intake. So that alone just throws out the validity of all of the rest of the data because it would skew protein intake, fat intake, carbohydrate intake, and intake of every other food and nutrient. In other words, they have bad memories or they're lying. Yeah. I mean, I I remember when I was in training, we were taught, okay, whatever people tell you they eat, double it. And whenever right. people tell you they exercise, cut it in half. That's right. People <laughs> always report. They want to please on, you. They want to right please thing. you or they want to do like if uh, uh, they want to report what they think you want to hear, essentially. That's and unless you're like weighing tendency. and measuring every single meal every like day and writing it down, yeah. then, you know, you're not going to be able to report what you ate. I mean, I don't know how much I ate no, yesterday or whatever. I'm like, I ate a little of this, I had some of that. I took a few bites of this. It's like, And if you, even if you, if you had two plates and the, the only difference, you know, one had a hundred or 200 more calories, visually, you couldn't even tell the difference. Yeah. So like you said, unless you're weighing and actually specifically measuring them, and even then, there are challenges on how to do that best to, yeah, you know, to, it's true. In, in a ward. And Mayo Clinic wrote a big review showing yeah. how these types of assessments, these memory-based assessments or food frequency questionnaires, really weren't valid. And yeah. they were so undermining the quality of all the science they're based on. So almost everything we hear about nutrition, almost whole, everything, is based on these type of studies, which it, are fundamentally flawed. And there's a guy named John Ioannidis, yeah. who, you know, is, is a Stanford professor who loves to study studies. And he's like, 80% of these type of studies, we call them observational or population studies or comparison studies, they 80% get proven wrong, ultimately, when they're subjected to randomized, randomized controlled, controlled trials, trials yeah. which is a true experiment, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's extremely critical <laughs> of nutritional epidemiology. He's basically said that it's worthless in, yeah. in the in the way that it's constructed now, and it could be improved by better measurement techniques and using some new technologies. To yeah, maybe do that like more people take pictures of their food, yeah. and then it goes into a computer AI yeah. system and it exactly. measures them. Like that yeah. would be cool. And then they're testing that, and yeah. that would help a lot. The other problem you also mentioned is. 
in any field outside of nutritional epidemiology, uh, a, an increase of risk of just 10% would be seen as completely uh, meaningless. insignificant, meaningless. meaningless, that you have this to see noise. at least a doubling of risk, like a 100% increase or a twofold increase or more in order to be able to know that you're not just dealing with chance, yeah. you know, uh, indistinguishable from chance. And, and the guy who published the study, uh, Walter Willard and, and others at Harvard, I and mean, this comes out of Harvard, these are, yeah. these are stand up guys, but yeah. they've spent their whole life committed to epidemiology yeah. and, and they defend it tooth and nail. Yeah. You know, and I, I remember yeah. speaking to Ron Krauss, who's an experimental scientist who studies cholesterol and heart disease. Fat. And he's like, listen, you know, those are helpful for generating hypothesis, but they don't prove anything. And these yeah. guys who run around saying that they're proving something are misleading people. And and he said, you know, you need to see a change of at least, you know, two. And Walter Willett said to me once, you know, well, we found this with smoking, that smoking right. causes cancer. But the increased risk was 20 or 2,000 yeah, yeah, percent. Two, two to 3,000 percent. Not 10 percent. Yeah. So yeah. like if it's 10 percent and not 1,000 or 2,000 percent, at least 100 percent, yeah. it's it's it's, and, it's just and, worth ignoring. And like the thing with eggs that came out recently, which were, right. oh, eggs are terrible, but it's like, you know. 13 percent, 8 percent. I mean, rarely in nutritional epidemi epidemiology do you see any effects uh, even over 50%, much less 100%. And usually it's more in like the 10 to 15% range, which and is which is meaningless. It's crazy. And you can also see on both sides of the aisle, you see studies that are epidemiology that show that meat's completely safe Yeah, in the same way. And they're yeah. both kind of meaningless. Yeah, I mean, you know? the so, you know, to be fair, it's really hard to do large randomized controlled trials in nutrition because you got to, like you said, Impossible. you have to lock people in a, in a metabolic ward and keep them there for 20 years yeah. because of the effects, if, especially if we're looking at real outcomes, which rather than just endpoints like cholesterol, yeah. uh, there is something, there, something called the Bradford Hill criteria, which are criteria that uh, actually, I think were created around the time that these smoking studies were done because they're like, look, we can't just do a randomized control trial with smoking. We, we can't wait around for, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's, you guys that's, smoke for 20 years. You guys don't smoke, yeah, we'll see exactly. what happens. <laughs> so we need to figure out ways to, to better determine whether these correlations are actually meaningful and that there might be a causal relationship. Yeah. And one of those ways is what is the effect size? You know, how much of an increase do you see? Uh, another is, do you see, is it monotonic? Like, does it, continually grow go up with an increased dose is of a that linear thing. Yeah, is yeah. there a dose effect response? And there are many other criteria that you can use to kind of get closer to the idea that yeah. there's a causal relationship, yeah. but those are rarely applied in these kinds of studies. Yeah, and, the, and, the, and you know, and, and the, you know, the truth is that a lot of the times, you know, when they actually get subjected to research, it doesn't pan out. It like doesn't. the women's health study is a perfect example. It was yeah. based on the same nurses' health study that this was data was based on, yeah. which looked at nurses who took hormones back yeah. in the 70s and 80s. And it seemed like the women who took the hormones for menopause had less heart attacks and less yeah. strokes and less cancer and less dementia. And they were better. And it was like amazing. And everybody was taking hormones. And I remember one patient at, uh, when I was working at Canyon Ranch giving a talk questioning this back in the 90s because... There was starting to be literature that was starting to like poke holes in this whole right. idea. And I was like paying attention to it. It wasn't like a big study, but smaller studies. And they were like, my doctor said, if you don't prescribe hormones to me, that's malpractice. And I was like, okay. And then in, <laughs> then, then, yeah. then the Women's Health Initiative came out, which yeah. was a woman's study, was commissioned by Bernadette Healy, who was the head of the National Institute of Health, the first woman to head that up. She's like, men and women are different. Let's just study women. Yeah. It was a billion dollar study, hundred and something thousand women. And when they actually subjected it to an experiment, they found that no, the, the woman who took the hormones had more heart attacks, more cancer, more stroke, more death. Oops. Oops. That's and, a big and, oops. and the women who took the hormones back in the seventies and eighties, those are the women who cared about their health. They went to their doctor. Right. They, they, they wanted to do everything they could to prevent disease. They exercised, yeah. they ate well, they didn't smoke. That's why they didn't have yeah. heart attacks, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, there are many, many other examples too, like antioxidant vitamins, like vitamin A and vitamin E in the diet, you know, reduce the risk of cancer and heart disease and things like that. But then when they're given an isolated high doses in RCTs, 
they not only don't have that effect, but they actually can sometimes have the opposite effect. Well, yeah, like the carrot side where you take like smokers and right. you give them super high doses of a single antioxidant like beta carotene, which just speaks to the, I, I hate to say this, but the ignorance of the researchers yeah. that don't understand how antioxidants uh, exactly. work, which is they work as a They're, team. And if you give an antioxidant, it becomes an oxidant. And so it's like, it becomes <laughs> yeah. like a cascade of, of like a wildfire that yeah. you start. It makes sense in smokers. But that's a great example of why doing this kind of research, like we're so obsessed with food quantity and the quantity of macronutrients and the quantity of specific foods like red meat or saturated fat or cholesterol. Mm. Uh, be, it comes from our reductionist paradigm. And yeah. you, you a functional medicine guy. Yeah. I'm a functional medicine guy. We understand the importance of looking at things from a systems approach. So what if we instead focused on food quality instead of food quantity? You can't talk about how healthy red meat is completely out of the context in which it's eaten. Right. <laughs> you know, if someone's eating red meat in the context of Big Macs and fast food and hot dogs and things like that, do we really think that that's going to have the same impact as yeah. someone eating a paleo diet where two thirds or three quarters of their plate is vegetables and plants and then they have, a, you know, a steak? Right. It's absolutely not the same. And yeah. yet in the research, it is it, it shows up as the same. And then interesting, I don't know if you probably saw this years ago, they looked at vegetarians and meat eaters who shopped at health food stores. So yeah. presumably ate a healthy diet yeah. in the context of having meat or no meat. And yeah. both of those groups had their risk of death reduced in That's, half. Yeah. And you know, I, you know, I, 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 I but think, no difference between the there was meat no difference. No, there was no difference. You know, yeah. And there's so many studies that, you know, you can argue on both sides, which is why the debate gets so confusing because there's epidemiology on both sides, but the randomized trials are really hard to do. Well, so let me, let me just address that because that's a, that's an interesting point. Um, so the only studies that have shown a lifespan difference for vegetarians were the seventh day Adventist studies. Mm. Now talk about healthy user bias and seventh yeah. day Adventists don't drink, they don't smoke. They're advised to eat, to exercise as part of their religion. So you've got a community with they, purpose they, they live and meaning, in community, which of, actually, you know, there was a study that came out recently was showing if I, you don't have I purpose, that. you die, That's right? right. And so they so, have purpose. So and they meaning. are not, you cannot compare that population with people on a standard American diet eating meat. That's comparing apples to oranges. Yeah. If you want to compare them, you got to compare them with another healthy reference population, which I call like nutrivores, let's say. So like the health food study was one. There are three other studies. I like that Nutrivore. I Nutrivore. Like that. I'm a Nutrivore. Yeah. I'm like I'm a, a Nutrivore. I'm a heat-seeking missile for nutrients in <laughs> exactly. my food. I like that. Yeah, I get nutrients from lots of different <laughs> foods. Um, so yeah, there there have been three other studies that that uh, aside from the health food study that your shoppers study that you're talking about, Epic was one of them. There was a study out of Germany, um, and uh, I'm not remembering the the fourth right now, but they all looked at people who were making healthier cho choices. In one, they looked at people who subscribed to health magazines and fitness magazines. So it was a kind of another way of getting right. at the health food store. The uh, people who subscribe to Chris Kresser's podcast. <laughs> we, have, we don't have that yet, but I'd like to see that study. Uh, and then there was a study called the 45 and up in Australia. And they didn't select a healthy reference population, but they controlled for just about every potential confounding factor mm -hmm. that you can imagine. Yeah. And all of these studies showed exactly what the health food shopper study showed is that nutrivores or people who are conscious about their health live longer and, mm. and don't have as much early death as people who are not. But there was no difference in lifespan with vegetarians and yeah. omnivores, right. it, it, omnivorous and nutrivores. Right. So, so depends on the population. Yeah. So in terms of meat, you know, there's arguments around the, <laughs> the meat from various studies that one, it increases inflammation. The two, it screws up your microbiome and increases something called TMAO, which is a cause of heart attack. We, this is being studied at Cleveland Clinic with Stan Hazen, who we've had on the podcast. That it has saturated fat that's harmful. That it promotes, you know, all these harmful effects. Um, how do you counter that? Well, I think I just did. <laughs> well, that's so, epidemiology, but like experimentally, like the TMAO study is interesting. And somebody, yeah, I mean, I mean it would take it would take five podcasts to counter all of those. And well, let's just I, give I us have, the Reader's Digest okay, version because so, I've written a lot about each of these. And, and by the way, what, know, is, what is the what is yeah, the, the link? short link? Go to Cresser co slash Rogan. <laughs> 
And the reason it's Rogan is because I put this all Crescent. together. Crescent.co slash Rogan. R-O-G-A-N. Right. And I should have created one that's slash Hyman. <laughs> uh, but this came from, I, as you know, I, sure. I was uh, sure. Joe Rogan invited me on his yeah. show to debate Dr. Joel yeah. Kahn, yeah. Uh, who is representing the vegan perspective. And He's I a was vegan cardiologist. Vegan cardiologist. And yeah. I was representing the, the Nutrivore perspective. Not the eat a Big Mac perspective, but like eat healthy food that could include meat. Um, and so I go, I, I break down every single one of those arguments in excruciating detail. You can go and read those articles if you want the full, um, And I encourage people full, who really care about this to look report. at it themselves because- Yeah, it's all referenced, peer-reviewed yeah. studies. You can read the study there. yourself. He, he links to the study. You can read it yourself. You can make your own decision yeah. and, 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 and he kind of guides you through how to interpret it. Right. So- Inflammation, it is, again, a matter of context. I'm not aware of any study that convincingly shows that eating red meat in the context of a, a whole foods diet with plenty of plant foods as well significantly contributes to inflammation. That, that, that research just hasn't been done. There, there was one study I saw, it was fascinating. It was a feedlot beef versus kangaroo meat. That right. was done in Australia. Yeah. And, and there's something called cytokines in your blood, which are markers of inflammation. When they eat, you know, ounce for ounce, the feedlot meat, it actually caused inflammation. Right. When they ate the kangaroo meat, wild meat, it reduced inflammation. Yeah, exactly, because of the different fatty acid profiles. So that's what I mean about context. You know, someone who is getting, you know, buying pasture-raised beef, for example, from a local farmer, or a, a meat CSA, that's going to have a different impact than someone who is eating, you know, commodity CAFO beef. That's and, confined animal feeding operations, factory farm beef, right? Right. So factory farm beef versus grass finished beef, different animals, yeah. literally. Yeah. The TMAO thing I've written at least three articles about, it's a very interesting hypothesis. I think it does bear further research, but one of the most troubling aspects of it is that fish is by far the highest source of TMAO in the diet. Then you know, red meat doesn't even register on the scale if you put fish next yeah. to it. And fish and seafood are consistently ranked you know, associ again, this is, you know, nu nutritional epidemiology, but they're inversely correlated with the risk of heart disease. And it looks like they're, they're protective, eating fish. They're protective. protective. So I haven't heard a reasonable explanation yet for why, how that could be the case if TMAO in the diet is problematic. The other issue is that the TMAO production of or the production of TMAO from carnitine in the, in the meat, which is how mm -hmm. it happens. Mm -hmm. It's is highly awesome. dependent on the state of the microbiome. Yeah. So again, if somebody is eating plant foods and other things and that are helping their microbiome, they're going to be less likely to pr to produce large amounts of TAMO versus someone who is eating a pr highly processed and refined diet, which we know is antithetical to the health of the microbiome. Not the meat, it's what you eat with it, right? I, exactly. re I remember the Stan Hayes into the study and he like, basically got these vegetarians or vegans <laughs> Uh, and meat eaters and tested their TMA levels. The meat eaters really had high levels and the vegetarians or vegans, they didn't. And then he got the vegan to eat a steak, which I don't know how he did that, but that was, that would be interesting. <laughs> yeah. And, and then he measured and there was no increase in TMA levels. Yeah. So I, I'm, you know, like, I, you know, I don't want to have heart disease. So I'm like, I'm eating grass fed meats and I'm like, I don't, I don't want to get in trouble. So <laughs> I'm, I'm like, oh, I'm going to test my TMA levels. So yeah. I went and tested it. Now you can get this test yeah. at reputable labs. And I was like, oh, my TMA levels low even though we eat grass-fed meats. And yeah. and it's because 70 to 80% of my diet is plant-rich diet. That's right. and, and that's why the vegan didn't see a big increase in TMAO. Right, exactly. When they ate the so steak. so yeah. it's, it, I, I was only being partially flippant when I said I already answered it, but it is really all about context and about food quality rather than food quantity. We have to shift out of this reductionist paradigm where we're just looking at isolated nutrients and foods outside of the the context that they're eaten in. So let's talk about like feedlot versus grass-fed beef because, mm -hmm. you know, the real cost of those foods right now don't reflect, I mean, the, the, I mean, the price that you price, pay, the yeah. price you pay at the checkout counter doesn't yeah. reflect the true cost, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at the cost of feedlot beef, yeah. it's enormous, right? One, 
it destroys the environment. Yeah. You know, the fertilizers that are grown and the pesticides and herbicides that are used to grow their feed pollutes our waterways, creates dead zones, kill, destroys biodiversity, depletes our soil, depletes our aquifers. Uh, it's one of the biggest sources of climate change. It's like a freaking disaster, plus the overuse of antibiotics, causes superbugs. I mean, the literal costs are in the billions, if not trillions of dollars the secondary cost that we don't actually pay at the checkout counter. Whereas grass-fed beef, on the other hand, restores the soil, protects our water supplies, increases biodiversity, and its cost is really should be far less. It should be a dollar a pound instead right. of you know $20 a pound and vice versa. The a feedlot beef should probably be $100 a pound or $1,000 a pound. Right. So given that aside, okay, because the cost is an issue yeah. and hopefully that's gonna change as we shift to regenerative agriculture. But the quality, let's talk about the quality of these two different animals. And and does it really matter? Because if you are, uh, you know, on a budget and, you know, you can't afford a $70 grass-fed ribeye steak. Yeah. Like, like, how bad is it to eat a feedlot cow versus, I mean, if you had to choose between like a diet that was, let's say, you know, a pure vegan diet or a diet that also included feedlot beef, if you couldn't afford the grass-fed beef, What's the deal? I, I wouldn't do a pure vegan diet. I think there are a lot of ways that you can get. So the real question is nutrient density. Yeah. And, you know, if we say we're nutrivores, we're concerned with a nutrient intake. I'm going to steal because... that. That's really good. I'm going I'm uh, I'm to attribute you for a while and then I'm just going to take it. <laughs> well done. I like it. Well, so, well, I remember Rick Warren was, he's like, he always said, you know, you hear something you like, you go, so and so said that. Right. And then now, you go, now I've covered my, then you my, go, it's been said <laughs> that. Yeah. And then you go, I've always said I've, that. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> you did the CYA part. If, if I ever come after you, you can point to, I attributed it to you. Um, no. So uh, in fairness, I first heard about this from Sarah Ballantyne. I'm not sure who she heard it from, but it, you know, it, it's around. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I mean, uh, I've, I actually have, uh, often say to my patients, um, it's it would be better in some way from a nutrient density standpoint to be a vegetarian that eats organ meats and shellfish than a meat eater that only eats lean cuts of meat from a nutrient perspective. Yeah, and true. the reason for that is that when you look at- The liver, kidney, thymus, heart, you know- all the awful stuff. And <laughs> oysters, clams, uh, and the, these shellfish, like when you look at nutrient density on a chart and by what, what density refers to is the concentration of nutrients per calorie right. of food. The nutrient to calorie ratio. We talked about that in my it, first it, book almost it, 20 years ago, the exactly. nutrient to calorie ratio. Yeah. And organ meats are at the top of the list and shellfish are very close to being at the top of the list. Herbs and spices yeah. are, are up there too. Yeah, I was shocked and, once I didn't interrupt, but I, yeah. I was shocked. I looked at a, a chart of nutrient levels yeah. in liver yeah. and like all the best vegetables you could eat. And it close. made the vegetables look like junk food. <laughs> yeah, totally. I was like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and, and you know, our ancestors knew this. Yeah. Like uh, even hunter-gatherer tribes that are studied, they'll throw the muscle meat to the dogs. They'll go right mm. for the liver and all of the other organ meats uh, because they somehow they knew even without those charts that the nutrient most nutrient dense foods were were the organ meats. Is that what so, uh, Kevin Kevin Costner ain't in the dance with the wolf? Like, <laughs> right, kill the buffalo and ate the liver. <laughs> that's right? right. That's right. <laughs> he wasn't chewing on a steak. So yeah, I mean, most of us don't eat a lot of these foods now, but I, I, if veg, a vegetarian or vegan comes to me and they're, um, you know, anemic and they have a lot of the other deficiencies that can sometimes happen on those diets and they say that they're willing to eat some animal foods, but they want to restrict it as much as possible, then we'll talk about maybe just strategically adding some organ meats and shellfish into the diet. Um, but you know, going back to your, your original question, uh, I think there are also ways that you can work in pasture raised animal foods into your diet that don't have to be that costly. So this is like the nose to tail eating that has mm -hmm. become, you know, in big cities, there are lots of yeah. nose to tail restaurants. Yeah. Now we're going to maybe go out to one yes. tonight. We're going to have some awful um, food, <laughs> some awful foods. That's o -F -F -A -L. That's right. So, <laughs> Um, you know, eating the, the more affordable cuts like uh, the shanks or the oxtail or the chuck roast, like those are actually very rich in collagen, which I'm sure most yeah. people have heard by now is really important 
Um, other side of the protein occasion uh, or, or equation, it's good for our joints, it's good for our soft tissues. Um, and you can go to the butcher and you can often get these cuts, even if they're pasture raised, uh, pretty affordably. So you yeah. don't have to eat the $70 ribeye to benefit. From yeah, it's it. funny. A friend of mine was telling me he, he has this ranch called the uh, Mariposa Ranch mm -hmm. uh, in California. And he gets, you know, he buys like a quarter of a cow. Yep. It's grass fed and it's averages about eight bucks a pound. Yeah. Which, when you think about it, if the serving ounce serving size is four ounces, that's four servings. Yeah. So it's basically two dollars a serving. Yeah. Which is half the price of a Big Mac. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the way we do. we have a big chest freezer right? in our basement. Half the price we, of we a Big it. Mac for grass fed meat. That Absolutely. ain't bad. Absolutely. That ain't bad at all. So, um, in terms of the um, the other factors, in terms of of nutrient quality what else yeah. is different between grass-fed and feedlot beef so, so the you know two of the biggest differences are the fatty acid profile um and the new and the the levels of uh vitamins and minerals so the in terms of fatty and acid and antioxidants yeah so the the fatty acids uh, pasture-raised beef will have significantly more omega three fats, which is the um, good stuff. The good stuff, EPA and DHA, that particularly the long mm -hmm. chain omega threes. Mm -hmm. And what's one of the issues with plant based diets is they only have the shorter chain omega threes like alpha linolenic acid, and those have to go through an extensive conversion process in the body to get to EPA and DHA. All this plant-based omega threes, you know, it's good, but it, it only about ten yeah, percent converts. Le, so. No, actually, less than one half of one percent of ALA gets converted to DHA, oh, that's and that's terrible. that's assuming you have all the nutri enough of all the nutrients to required for those enzymes in all that the, cycle, yeah. which a lot of vegetarians or vegans can be low in. And genetically, that you can do it because a lot of people aren't good exactly. at it. Exactly, some people just don't even have the enzymes for some of those conversions. So. Um, fatty acid profile, more omega threes, and and, uh, and then more nutrients because grass is actually pretty nutrient dense. But we as humans can't absorb those nutrients. I don't recommend eating grass. Yeah. But the cows can eat grass and and turn that into nutrients that we can then access in a very bioavailable way. Yeah. So so it's it also has more CLA, which is a special yep. fat that, that actually acid. is anti cancer, mm -hmm. helps speed up your metabolism. Yeah. It has extra levels of certain antioxidants that are really yep. hard to get, like catalase, superoxide dismutase, things that are fancy yep. words, but they're like super antioxidants. Absolutely. Uh, higher levels of iron, absorbable iron, nutrients. Beam iron. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, it's it's quite interesting and and. Um, you know, it's also what we ate forever. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there hasn't been like a, a voluntary vegan society on the planet. Not that we know of. You know, yeah. Vegan, yeah as, a, as a traditional society. And that, I mean, that in itself doesn't mean that, that, that the vegan diet is, is not healthy or optimal. But when you combine that with the modern scientific evidence on nutrient values um, and, and, th and consider things like bioavailability and then regenerative agriculture and how mm -hmm. we could even feed the planet with mm -hmm. everybody consuming mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, a vegan diet versus, mm -hmm. you know, there's so much land that can't be cultivated yeah. for plant foods and crops, but could be grazed. Yeah. Um, if we're doing a better job of it. So yeah. it makes sense from a lot of different perspectives. It's true. I mean, that, you know, the argument is, oh, well, you can't do that at scale. It won't produce enough cattle. It's good for a couple of hippies on the fringe. Or, But, you know, uh, Alan Williams, his PhD, he was an incredible regenerative farmer, sixth generation Mississippi farmer, uh, and has, you know, studied this upside and down and yeah. published a lot on this. Uh, and and he, he said that he did the math in America you know, we, we slaughter about 29 million cows a year. And he said, we have enough um, land that's either unused or minimally used or is available through different right. things, or we could convert the feedlots to the corn and soy fields that are used for feedlots into right. grazing, that we could produce twice, almost twice as much beef or cows as we do now and people say oh well you know you don't get as much meat off of grass-fed cow as a feedlot cow yeah because you're not throwing it full of hormones and antibiotics <laughs> yeah. but even then you still got like almost double the amount of cows it's possible and and around the world much land is not usable for crop land Absolutely. and it's degraded land and it's land that has plants that only the cows can eat and they're like an incredible conversion factory yeah, let them for nutrients. The and I read also fascinating uh, as I'm sort of researching my new book, Food Fix, that, that there are farmers who plant different types 
of forage grasses and plants that have different properties. So just as you know, a blueberry has a different phytonutrient profile than sort of broccoli, so do the plants that they forage on. And that has different qualitative effects on the meat. Yeah. So it's fascinating. So you actually can get like your, you know, conversion of these phytochemicals into animal foods that can actually improve your health. Yeah. It's and fascinating, let, right? Yeah. Let that there's six chambers of the stomach do all the work. You know, we've only got the one. Yeah. Oh, it's true. I mean, how I got into nutrition. I don't know if you know the story, but I, <laughs> I was in Cornell and I, I was kind of this hippie living in this whole group house with a bunch of vegetarians. And you and I have both been vegetarian yeah. or vegan in the past. <clears throat> and um, he he was a PhD to nutrition and he was studying ruminants and the he, fiber yeah. and the microbiome. They didn't call yeah. it the microbiome. Right. But, he was studying all this stuff and gave me this book called Nutrition Against Disease by Roger Williams. I read in the 70s, 80s. It was just it just completely, you know, kind of set me up for this type yeah. of thinking. Yeah. And and when you when you look at this sort of dichotomy um of of vegan and and people who want to eat healthy meat, I mean it's it's sort of a false dichotomy. And what what disturbs me is when I see you know, these massive reports come out, like the Eat Lancet Commission report, yeah. which I'm sure you saw. Travesty. There was a lot of good in it. I mean, it, it brought up the idea that, you know, we should be eating a healthier diet, that climate change is driven by our current agricultural system, that we need to be eating, you know, more plant foods, that, you know, factory farm meat is bad. So there were, there were a lot of pluses, but it was also concluding that we should either cut our meat consumption by 90 or 100%. So what do you say to that? Well, and that I mean, was that was like 37 scientists who apparently analyzed all the world's literature and came up with this conclusion of a universal healthy diet. It's really disappointing because their data did not support their conclusions at all. And again, I've written extensively about that. You can, you know, listeners can check it out if they want the detail. But, um, you know, we've already basically covered the main problems with that study when we talked about the issues with observational. So a lot of it was based, the head, the yeah. head author of that study was the guy who just published this study exactly. saying that meat kills yeah. based on a 10% yeah. increase in a population yeah, and, study. And that was really, it was a coordinated media campaign. It was funded by a couple of, billi you know, a billionaire couple in Scandinavia. And uh, I remember reading something like uh, the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions from all of the flights and their private jet that they took around the world to promote the study were larger than what would be saved by making the diet changes right. or something like yeah, that. Yeah, well, it, it, I heard if you fly from LA to London, you'd have to be vegan for five years to compensate for the amount of right. greenhouse gases produced. Right, <laughs> right. So, but only if you're eating factory farm meat. Yeah, you know, it's it's like eat real food and you know, meat is a very nutrient dense food uh, with lots of bioavailable uh, nutrients that can be easily absorbed and uh, it has a lot of advantages. And, you know, the the amount of it that each person will need, eat can depend on a lot of different factors. But, uh, you know, again, not to beat a dead horse, like we, we, we have to shift the conversation more to quality uh, rather yeah. than quantity. And there have been some good studies. Do you remember the one at Stanford? It was a weight loss trial, but they were they looked at low fat difference between low fat and low carb, but instead of just changing the, the carbohydrate and not caring about the quality of food, they put everyone on a high quality diet and, and then they only so changed they the fat. So they qualitarians. Yeah, quality <laughs> low fat diet, quality high fat, real food, low fat, real food, high fat, low carb. And they didn't yeah. see much of a difference there. Yeah. Both were, both lost weight compared to the standard reference diet, sure. but there wasn't a, a huge difference between those two. And so, you know, that just f supports the point that I think we've been making all along, which is that quality is what makes the biggest difference. Quality and what else you're eating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So I'm, we're not saying you should have like a 32 ounce steak every day and one string bean. Right. It's like, you know, 500 string beans and yeah. a four ounce or five ounce piece of steak. Yeah. I mean, it's you know. just like the plate. If you just think about the plate, most of it will be various kinds of plant foods. It could be, you know, non starchy vegetables, salad, sweet potato. Those are all plants. And then you might have a serving of fish or meat. Yeah. It's pretty simple, really. So it's it your your work is really tremendous, Chris, because you, you you've taken all this disparate information from all these different studies, all the misleading headlines, all the propaganda that's put out there by various groups, and you've sort of synthesized it in a way that's easy to understand, that's accessible. And so 
I encourage everybody to go to chriscrestford.com just to go look at the work That's he's right. done. He's got lots of reports, lots of books. It's it's a tremendous resource. If you have a question about anything like, or I'm writing a book and I want to know, what, what does the latest data say about omega-6 fats? Well, I'll go to Chris because he's already read all the studies. He's summarized <laughs> them and saves me a lot of work. So thank you, Chris, because like, I don't have time you. to go on. <laughs> um, So let's talk about um, the approach that we both take, which is, it, is, is really trying to look at the body as a system. And, and the, the conversation we just had is, is really in a similar way, looking at the whole picture. You can't just cherry pick this and that and look at this study or that study. You've got to understand the context of everything. And that's what functional medicine is. It's a, it's a science of looking at the root causes of disease. So, so how did you get into functional medicine? I mean, what happened? Well, uh, like you and many others, it was through my own struggle with uh, illness. So I was traveling in Indonesia, surfing. I was uh, on a around the world surf trip in my early twenties. Um, sold everything I owned, took off to That's see the awesome. world. It was pretty awesome up until that point, and even even after that point. Um, but I, you know, I, I got uh, three parasite infections all simultaneously. I was exposed to uh, contaminated water um, in the surf break. Actually, a number of other people got. There were some cows that were defecating in a kind of stagnant pool of water near the river, and the locals dug a trench between that and the, the river, and the r river went out into the ocean with all that water. So I had um, entamoeba histolytica, giardia, and blastocystis hominis oh, all together. Tri triple yeah, header. Triple header. Um, nearly killed me. I uh, had many years of, of being completely uh, incapacitated, uh, you know, really just spent a long time curled up in a ball in pain on the floor during mm. those that period and um you know at, at, i saw con my conventional doctors and they were well meaning and they tried to help but they didn't have the tools to help and eventually i i basic i stumbled on a, a, a you know nutrient dense nutrivore paleo type of diet which was mm. a big factor in my healing process but then i also stumbled on functional medicine mm. um this was the night late nineties. So you were practicing functional medicine by then, but one of the few people, yeah, was I like think me and like <laughs> yeah, seven five other, other people, people. it was not well known. Yeah. I didn't even know that what I, the perspective I was taking was functional medicine at that time. I didn't know I had a name, but it just made sense to me that addressing the root cause of the problem was the way to go. And then, you know, following in the footsteps of pioneers like yourself, um, I knew that was the type of medicine that I wanted to practice and, you know, to be able to help others who are dealing with complex chronic illness to recover. Yeah. And your California Center for Functional Medicine is really a pioneering center where people come from all over the world to come see you and your colleagues to help them sort through these chronic yeah. problems for which Absolutely. often we don't have great solutions. And, yeah. you know, you, you've also realized that, um, you know, we have a dearth of one doctors yeah. and two in general and two we have like an incredible scarcity of doctors who know how to practice functional medicine yes and we don't have a healthcare system that supports it and you and i both know both from our own experiences of healing and recovery and from treating thousands of patients and seeing this over and over again this is not the placebo effect this no. is not just some you know crystal healing <laughs> with feathers and <laughs> candles i mean this is hardcore science yeah that yeah. is out there. And yeah. I, I don't know, Chris, if you've, you've seen this new book, it's called Network Medicine. No. And I have a copy, I'll show you. It's the first real hardcore scientific text by these researchers at Harvard that maps out the whole idea of complex systems biology in a clinical way. And it's called network oh, wow. medicine, I'll network medicine. It sure. It's yeah. not a read for the average person, yeah. I promise you, but you can go look it up. <laughs> And, and it is a brilliant analysis of the failure of our current diagnosis system yeah. to help address chronic disease. And, and the thing I respect about you, Chris, is that you, you've really taken this problem to heart. You, you say, well, like, this is only available to a few people, but what if not just a few hundred or a thousand people could have access to this? What if millions can, how do we, and how do we do this? Like, you're, you're not gonna be able to go into medical schools and just, completely change the curriculum overnight or if yeah. i were king i would do that like yeah. in a minute <laughs> you're I mean, working on it i'm working on a cleveland yeah. clinic yeah we, we like we okay. got there and i met with the dean i'm like hey dean you know like 
uh, what's up with no nutrition in the curriculum yeah. here? Don't you think nutrition <laughs> should be in the curriculum? He's like, yeah, yeah, okay. So we like started working on nutrition in the yeah. curriculum at Cleveland Clinic, which yeah. is, you know, uh, and it's, it's just stunning to me because it's food is the biggest cause of disease. Absolutely. It's the biggest cure for disease and yeah. doctors learn nothing about nutrition. Yeah. So, and what they learn is 50 years out of date. <laughs> right. So you were like, wait a minute, I, I, I can't wait to change medical schools. I can't wait to change reimbursement. I can't wait to change healthcare. I'm going to take all this research that I've done, all this clinical experience I have, I'm going to condense it into a practical training program for doctors, for healthcare professionals. And it's called the ADAPT program for practitioners. It's the ADAPT yeah. practitioner training program. Yep. And then you were like, wait a minute, doctors can't do everything or healthcare professionals can't do everything. It's not just doctors, it could be any healthcare professional. Yeah. They need help. And 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 80% of healthcare doesn't happen in the doctor's office, it happens at home and you need a coach. So yeah. you created a whole ADAPT health coach training program. Yeah. So tell us your journey to that and, and give us some detail about what these programs are and, and, and who's taken them and what's the sure. impact on their practices and their lives and their patients. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so, um, you know, it started, I, I was, after I graduated from school, I started to treat patients. I was having a lot of success. Um, one of the, un, you know, unintended consequences of that success was that my practice was full and I couldn't see many new patients. And I would get emails every day, pretty much, from friends, family members, other people who were, you know, wanting to come see me asking for referrals to other functional medicine practitioners that also had an ancestral health, you know, perspective as I do. And I couldn't make many, you know, there were a few people that were doing that, Mark. but not me. Yeah. He, there's a Masetta guy across the country, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, um, so it was really frustrating because I want to, I'm in this to help people and I couldn't help those people. Yeah. And so I, I, I realized like we have to, train more people. And of course, IFM, uh, Institute for Functional Medicine has been doing that in a phenomenal way for the last, what, 25, yeah, coming 25 up on years, yeah, yeah. 25 years, incredible programs have the highest, you know, deepest respect for what they're doing. And um, my learning style is a little bit different. I'm a learn by doing kind, yeah. of, kind of person. And I like that, like apprentice style learning, yeah. you know, like, and what I was really looking for was something like what we might call a functional medicine residency or internship, yeah, right. where you kind of peek behind the shoulder of someone yeah. who's doing it on a daily basis. Yeah. And I saw that that was um, not available uh, in, yeah. in the functional medicine training space. And that's the kind of training I would have wanted to yeah. have, um, af you know, after doing the, some of the foundational which, stuff. Which you and I both kind of did by being scrappy and exactly. calling this one and calling that one. What do but, you do? And what do right. you do? And what but that takes do? a long time. It's, it's, it's not ass. that efficient. It took me 20 years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I was like, how can we condense this? And, yeah. you know, a one year program where people get practical hands-on experience in, in like what lab to order, not just that you should do SIBO breath testing, but here are the five Which company. Here are the five options, right. and here are the pros and cons of each. And here's how you interpret the test results. It, you can't just use the algorithm that they generate. You actually right. have to know how to right. interpret it. And right. here's how you put a protocol together based on those results. Right. And right. you know, and here's and, how you know, don't do something stupid. Yeah, and here's how. Yeah, and here's how you tailor it for right. if someone who's got high methane versus high hydrogen, and you know. So that's not available in academic settings for because they're often restricted by what yeah. they can't talk about specific tests and specific well, products. Well, the problem is you say that you go to your doctor, say, check your cholesterol. Right. Well, you go to any lab and pretty much check your cholesterol. Yeah. With functional medicine, it's like, no, you got to go to the list lab and yeah. it's got to be this and test. And your LDL particle number. We right. want to know your numbers and your size. Yeah. So. And the same thing with supplements. Like right. you can say, oh, take penicillin or take Lipitor. Right. But you'll, you don't say they say take Atorvastatin, which is the generic name. But everybody <laughs> right. knows there's only one of those. Yeah. yeah. And and so there's like it's like a game. Whereas you can't say, okay, take turmeric. Well, you can't say that. You got to say take this company's turmeric right, because, because it's I've more done bioavailable the and, and this is absorption. Right. And yeah. So. So I wanted people to just be able to like do a one year training and get out there and start helping people. And that's what the adopt practitioner training program is. It's for licensed clinicians like MDs, DOs, also nurse practitioners, uh, you know, physical therapy, occupational therapists, RDs, CNSs, you know, people who have a license who are able to order these tests and, and, and offer these treatments to patients. And it's sort of like an apprenticeship slash training wheels. Yeah. Residency, guide rails, internship. Where you can kind of start to really 
And then we also cover how do you run a functional medicine practice? I mean, you know, that's very different than running a conventional medicine practice. It's a whole different ball game. And so you could be the best functional medicine clinician out there, but you're just going to be like playing air guitar in your bedroom if you don't actually know how to set up and run a a functional practice. So, so that was launched in 2016 and it's been really successful. We've trained over 400 doctors and other licensed clinicians from all over the world. Uh, we've heard just amazing feedback and input from from how it's transformed people's practices and and the lives of the thousands or you know tens or hundreds of thousands of patients that they're touching now. So yeah, I mean, I think I think the Institute for Functional Medicine is sort of like medical school, right? And you get the foundational theory and the concepts, which and you is learn super how to important. Think, and then you get you know this practical application yeah. allows you to adapt your practice exactly. to functional medicine yeah. right yeah and, as, as, uh, as people often struggle with that transition of like okay now i understand the basic concepts and theory how do i actually do, how you it? do it yeah 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 and i mean to you and jeff bland and everyone who is instrumental in in um in in ifm's history and getting that education out there i have the highest respect and appreciation for the the way that you've advanced functional medicine in our field it's amazing so and, and by the way it's a it's a nonprofit in super functional medicine it has to adhere to certain guidelines for getting continuing accreditation for continuing yeah. medication yeah. so we can't say use this lab or use this right. supplement or use this medication and it makes exactly. it very difficult and confusing. Okay, CoQ10. Yeah, which one? There's 5,000 of them out <laughs> yeah. there and most of them are crap. And, 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 and how and, do you and, know? Yeah. And then to keep the CEU status, they, you'd have to mention all 5,000 to, to, to make it. You either well, mention you, none oh, or yeah. all of them. Okay, I, didn't even, just, I didn't even know you yeah, could mention. No, you could do all of them. Can you imagine the slide? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 5,000 5, little bullet points of yeah. CoQ10 on there. Um, yeah, but I can because I'm just, I'm one person you know i'm You're not I'm offering a, continuing i'm not offering credits. continuing education and that is a potential downside of, of yeah. my program well, I, but I, it's I think not, if it's, it's about healing that. people and helping people yeah, yeah. Uh, honestly that it's less important so i did that for three years i'm still doing it and we launched it three years but a couple years in even in my own practice and in training clinicians and in writing unconventional medicine my last book and doing mm. that research I learned, you know, what you've already knew, I'm sure is like, there's going to be a shortage of 52,000 primary care providers by the year 2025. Yeah. And And, more. And and more probably. Yeah. Yeah. And they're already, that's arguably not even enough. Like what they're defining as enough is not enough to really serve people. The average visit with a doctor is 10 to 12 minutes. Some say now with new residents now, it's as low as eight minutes. That's yeah. barely enough time to say hello and write a prescription. It's certainly not enough time to talk about diet, lifestyle, and behavior change. And the, and the other problem is they don't let you talk. Like the uh, the average uh, time before you get interrupted is eighteen seconds. Yeah, eighteen seconds, twelve <laughs> seconds. I've seen that. Maybe yeah, because it's not they're not because because that's not that's it's just what's the symptom? What drug can I prescribe right. to to suppress that symptom? And so you know, I I realize that most healthcare is self care, as you said, like at least 80%, if not 90% of healthcare really happens outside of doctor's offices, even the functional medicine doctor's office. So, you know, a patient might come see me three or four times a year, but the other 99.9% of their their time, time, they eat three times, yeah, exactly. (laughs) They sleep every night. They sleep every night and have to manage their stress and deal with all that stuff. And behavior change is hard. That's, that is is the reality. And we, we know this because According to the CDC, uh, about 6% of Americans consistently engage in the top five health behaviors. And we're not talking about complex, you know, stuff like intermittent fasting and keto cycling, 6%. 6%. So these behaviors are maintaining a healthy weight, not smoking, not drinking excessively, getting enough physical activity and getting enough sleep. Okay, you and I are hopefully in the 6%. Yeah, 6%. <laughs> so, and, 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 and Mark, it's not because people don't know there is a lot of controversy over paleo, vegan, all that. There's not a lot of controversy about those five things. No. Everybody knows that right. they shouldn't be smoking a lot, drinking a lot. They should get some sleep and they should exercise. So are they not doing it because they don't know? Of course not. They're not doing it because they don't know how to change and they don't have the support that they need to change. And that's what I want to shift with the health coach training program. But we know from the science very mm-hmm. clearly that Friend power is far more powerful than willpower yes. to create behavior change. And yeah. we talked about this, but you know, I created this faith-based wellness program in a church where we got 
fifteen thousand people to lose a quarter million pounds in a year and get healthy. It wasn't a yeah. weight loss program; it was a health program. Yeah, and they did it in small groups with each other, yeah. without a health coach, yeah. without a nutritionist, yeah. without a doctor. Yeah, but use the power of love and each other and connection and accountability and feedback and support which is exactly what a health coach does. Absolutely. So it's, uh, Rick Warren said it best. He says, everybody needs a buddy. Yeah. So your health like coach it. is your buddy. Yeah. And and the science supports this. Hands Absolutely. down. Absolutely. Hands down. It's evidence-based. It's, it's, and it's, it's <laughs> what's striking me, there was this big study called the uh, Diabetes Prevention Program. And, and, and they scaled it up uh, and they they tested different versions of it, which is sort of a group diabetes program where you learn how to eat and exercise and so forth. And they tested, oh, what if a doctor delivers the program? How well do they do? What if a nurse does? What if a nutritionist does? What if some layperson does, who's another guy in the group? It was no difference. Uh, I, I remember one study, I love this study, which was looking at people who are mentally handicapped, um, who had obesity or diabetes. And they were challenged. And they gave them instructions on what to do and then told them to support each other and help each other. They had better health outcomes than getting treatment by the best doctors. Yeah. So their blood sugar got better. Their weight was, it was like, it yeah. was just the most amazing study. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, I'm so, sure it didn't surprise you. That doesn't no. surprise me, but it would probably surprise a lot of people. Yeah. 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 And it's just, um, the thing that's amazing about health coaching, like, and this is what I realized with the practitioner program, um, you know, there, there's only a limited number of people out there who can even do the practitioner training program because you have to have a, you know, the license and, the, and the, the skill and experience and qualification to be able to order those labs and perform those treatments. And so that's great. And I want to continue to grow that and expand it, but um, there, there's this, there's only so fast that that can grow, right? Because it's 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 limited, and and doc. So there'll never be enough doctors to help people yeah. make these changes. Yeah. And we could argue that doctors aren't the right people to make yeah. these changes because yeah. they don't get the training and nutrition, as you pointed out. But also, we need to lead. They need. They should be focused on doing the stuff that they are uniquely trained to do. Yeah. You know, procedures and tests yeah. and treatments and all of that. That doesn't make yeah. sense for most doctors to spend an hour talking to someone about nutrition. Right. It's not the most effective use of their time. Right. So, you know, health coaching, if someone is trained properly, and we can talk a little bit about that, they can, you know, complete a training in a year. And it doesn't require a medical background. You don't have to be, uh, you know, go to pre, go through pre-med in, 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 in school and do, you know, med school or anything like that to become a health coach. So we can scale that impact. And there's so many people out there, I imagine quite a few who are listening and, and watching mm -hmm. who are so passionate about health and they want to use that passion to make an impact. Yeah. And maybe they've had their own health story like you have and I have, or they want more meaning and purpose in their work. They want to wake up and feel excited about what they're doing and that they're changing lives. And this is like a profession that is just growing yeah. hugely. It's one of the fastest growing professions that there is in the US now, along with other health professions. It's already like a $6 billion market. Yeah. And it's just gonna get bigger because yeah. the writing is on the wall. Like changing our behavior is the single most important step we can take to preventing and reversing chronic disease. I'm more convinced of that than I, I ever have it's been. It's so true. And it's and it's it's powerful because people can have a huge impact on each other yeah. and um and you know if i and i'm gonna ask you in a minute if, if you were king what you would or you yeah. are of the world for a day <laughs> what would you do but if i were i would i would basically create a million or 10 million community health workers yeah aka health, health coaches. coaches yeah and and i think that would make a difference because the truth is that most of the things that people need to do like you said do not require high level medical yeah. intervention. And you can clean up 80% of the problems yeah. without ever seeing a doctor. And we're seeing this at Cleveland Clinic. We we use health coaches yeah. um, and we we have these small group sessions, yeah. um, partly because we had such a big waiting list, but was, mm -hmm. was, was also was my vision actually when I got there, I said, I don't want anybody Community. to see a doctor until they've gone through a 12 week program in yeah. a group. Makes sense. Then they might they not to even need us, to see one. Then, yeah. okay. Yeah. And I, I couldn't get it going. Yeah. It took like three or four years and yeah. then we started it. Yeah. And before they even see a doctor, they go yeah. into this program. It's called yeah. Functioning for Life. Yeah. And 
they work with each other. And yes, we have, you know, coaches and doctors and nutritionists teaching, which is great, but it's, it's the medicine of the group that yes. is the magic. Absolutely. And, and, uh, and the results are unbelievable. Yeah. When you think about it, I, there's this one woman, I just want to quickly tell her story, Janice, who was 65 and she was severely obese. She had heart failure. She had type two diabetes on insulin for 10 years. She had kidney failure. Her liver was starting to fail. She had high blood pressure. She was on a pile of meds and felt like crap all the time and was on her way out. She came to the group and just started with the simple lifestyle changes. It wasn't like tons of functional medicine testing or tons of supplements or anything. It was just like group support, lifestyle change, and a very powerful anti-inflammatory, low glycemic, whole foods yeah. diet. Ultra that, diet. Basically, yeah. <laughs> it was based, it's based on the 10-day detox diet, which yeah. essentially is like mostly plants with yeah. some healthy yeah. animal foods and, and not starch or sugar. And uh, in three days, she was off her insulin. In three months, she lost 43 pounds, but that was not the significant part. Her heart failure reversed, which you never see in medicine. Right. No. Her kidney failure reversed, which you never see <laughs> yeah. in medicine. With any drug, yeah. her liver failure got better. Her high blood pressure went away. She got off all her medications. And in a year, she lost 116 pounds and stayed that way. And what's more remarkable is that she said she saved out of her own pocket her co-pays for her medications, 20000 a year. Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> so, like, and this is the power of the group and the connection. Absolutely. And the operating system. So, if you have an iPhone, you can run it. You don't have to understand, you know, how Steve Jobs built it and right. how it all works underneath, but like it's pretty intuitive and it's pretty simple and you can do it. And it's the same thing with health coaching. You don't have to like be a PhD in nutrition no. or, you know, a doctor or have an extensive knowledge. But if you understand the operating system of what we're teaching, like right. that's what happened in the church. Yeah. We provided the content, the IP, the operating system, and then it's e it was easy for them yeah. to sort of implement it. Yeah, and in fact, that kind of expertise can often get in the way because health coaching is not about telling people what to do. That's the expert approach that comes out of the conventional medical paradigm. Yeah. And it can that's there's a place for that. You know, if I break my arm, I, you know, go to the doctor or the hospital and they tell me what to do, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to listen to that and I'm going to do that because it makes sense in that scenario. But telling people to how to change, what to do to change their behavior doesn't work. I mean, look, like, yeah. do you like to be told what to do? Yeah. <laughs> I don't like to be told what to do. Most people don't like to be told what to do. We have this natural inclination to resist. Yeah. And health coaches, when they're properly trained in, in, in these modalities like motivational interviewing and character strengths, positive psychology, goal setting, you know, accountability, they become what we call behavior change ninjas or yeah. change agents. They are experts in asking powerful questions, helping people to discover their own motivation for, for change. The why. Yeah, the why. So Behind a good example why. of that is like, imagine uh, a middle-aged woman who's got, you know, or, 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 you know, maybe in her 60s, she's got type two. She just got diagnosed with type two diabetes. The doctor says, you need to change your diet. Um, and forget about what the advice is, because often the advice is Love not that, good right, there. Right. But let's say it's even the right advice, and the and she, the doctor can't figure out why the the patient's not changing. For that patient, that's not enough of a motivation for whatever reason. Yeah. But if in working with the health coach and the health coach asking her questions discovers that she just had her first grandchild was mm. just born. And she's like, loves that grandkid more than anything and wants to see that grandchild grow up and, you know, wants to be at her wedding when she gets mm. married. And when she taps into that motivation, that's when everything shifts yeah. and yeah. she's able, because for her, that was really it. Yeah. So, I mean, True. this is like, we see, you're probably aware of these studies. I saw this recently where something like six or seven out of 10 people who even have recently have a heart attack don't change their diet. Oh my God, I saw that with my stepfather. That. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, he literally had his chest cracked open. He got a chest infection of his chest wall. He was in the ICU with his chest flayed open for a month <laughs> right. in the intensive care unit. And that wasn't enough, that, not enough. to make him change right. his diet. Right. So, I mean, this is why we need to get really 
focused on how can we, from an evidence-based perspective, support people in making successful and lasting change. And that's what, you know, a health coach program like ours, that's, um, you know, there's an organization now um, called the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaches, and they've teamed up with the National Board of Medical Examiners that you're familiar with in medicine. They determine what you need to do, you needed to do to get your MD. Yeah, answer <laughs> they, a lot of questions. Yeah, they <laughs> determine what someone who wants to be board board certified in gastroenterology or cardiology needs to learn. So this is a you know really legitimate organization, and they looked at the health coaching field and said, "Wow, <laughs> there's a lot of variation oh out here in terms of the quality so of these programs so and some programs that are teaching." Health coaching are not actually teaching these core health coaching skills that we're talking right. about. Like well, it's about behavior change. Yeah. They're just teaching people how to tell you how to tell people what to do, what to eat, and how to move. And that doesn't work. So they actually define the training and, and education that that someone should earn to become a cr- nationally recognized credentialed health coach. And then they a- approve schools that apply. And so we just became a, an NBC approved oh, wow. school, Amazing. which I, I haven't had a chance to tell you. No, it was just a couple of days ago where we got our approval, Fantastic. which is That's really, That's um, we feel we're so happy about it because we love the work that they're doing to advance the rigor of health coaching. And this will eventually open the door for it to be covered by health insurance, I think, mm-hmm. because if you're a health insurance company, you're not going to cover a health coach session with like Joe health coach who just decided took yeah. a weekend course and decided he was a health coach. You're going right. to want to see rigorous standards for for what that is, just like with any yeah. other healthcare profession. So No, it's great, Chris, what you're doing. I mean, just just one, taking the time. I mean, because you have a family, you you have a job, and you have to work, but taking the time that you take to really sift through the science, to to understand the nuances of what we know and don't know about health and nutrition, to to translate that into protocols and practices and in-depth understanding of how to apply this to, to develop a health coach program. I, I know you and I know how many literally thousands of hours it's taken of you and your time and your expertise. And for one, I'm grateful that you're out there doing this because I sure as hell didn't want to do it. <laughs> well, you got a few I, things on your I plate, felt Mark, like, to be fair. But to be honest with you, I actually have the same experience as you. I'm like, Somebody needs to do this. Yeah. And I started to do it at one point and I got like 40 pages into writing it all up and I'm like, <laughs> I can't do this. I, I gotta do other things. So. I've got 14 other big jobs. <laughs> yeah, I've got 14 other jobs. Yeah. That's true, I've way too many jobs. Yeah. But anyway, this is just incredible. And I, I think, uh, I just wanna acknowledge you, Chris, and I wanna just thank you for, for the work you do. And I encourage everybody really to go to chriscrestor.com if you have a question about anything, just Google X and Chris Kresser, <laughs> and I guarantee you there'll be something he's written about it over the last decade, and uh, and he's got a great podcast. He's got these training programs, which I encourage you to check out, and uh, I check out his book, The Paleo Cure. We can go to paleocurebook.com, his book, Unconventional Medicine, which is unconventionalmedicinebook.com, really great explanation of, of um, uh, functional medicine, and I'm, I'm one of the characters in it, so I like yes. that. So, so Chris, uh, last question. If... Um, if you were king or czar or you know um, you know president of the world for a day or, or as long as you could be, uh, what would be the changes that you would implement to improve the health uh, of 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 our nation and our and our world? It's a good question. Well, I I think I would pass laws that reduce the influence of big pharma, big food, and big ag. And oh, I know yeah. you're writing a book about half of that equation and that you feel as passionately about this as I do. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you look at the influence that industry has on everything from how medical research is done to uh, subsidies for junk food that, you know, that create price distortions and and make sure that, you know, and create an imbalance in the food system. Yeah, that's to, why grass-fed meat is so much more expensive exactly, than feedlot beef because exactly. we're paying, the government's Corn paying and, to grow the food for the feedlot beef. <laughs> exactly. So there's so many distortions that get created there. And, and you know, the fact that research, two-thirds of medical research is sponsored by pharmaceutical companies who have a vested interest in the outcome of those studies. And uh, by the way, m- uh, more than 10 times uh, as much nutritional research is funded by big food as it is by independent scientists. Right. (laughs) And, uh, you know, there's, uh, whatever people's feelings are on gun control, the, the, the pharmaceutical industry spends about 10 times more than the gun lobby does on, uh, uh, on lobbyists. So, Mm. 
uh, second only to the oil industry. Yeah. So they have a massive influence on every level of government and public policy. And I think until we address that, we're, our progress is going to be more limited than it should be. As you know, I, I, I was, I'm was i writing my book and I'm looking at lobbyists and what they're doing and it's it's staggering. There's 187 lobbyists per, per member, member of Congress. Of Congress. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's shocking. It's unbelievable. It's, yeah, and, most, and literally billions and billions of dollars. And I remember going to Washington as part of the uh, affordable, uh, affordable, um, uh, affordable Care Act, yeah. and I and I was you know trying to get a bill passed that was going to pay for lifestyle medicine. So right. group programs, exactly yeah. what we're doing, yeah. Yeah. that work. Yeah. <laughs> and we'd walk into the senator of this or the congressman or the person in the white house or the head of health and healing i mean the head of uh, the health and human services and they'd go like okay like what lobby group are you from and who do you work for and i'm like uh nobody yeah. and just the science and the patient i represent the patients and the science because i want science yeah. to become policy yeah and then senator harkin laughed and he was like Good luck. That would make too much sense. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and it was striking to me because they're not mm-hmm. used to seeing people who are advocating. And I literally, I had to pay, I mean, anybody stayed in Washington, the hotels are expensive. It's like yeah. 500 bucks a night. Yeah. I had to pay my own flight. I pay my own, yeah. you know, taxis and hotel and yeah. food. And it was thousands and thousands yeah. of dollars because I cared. And I had access and I was like, this is crazy. And then, and then on top of that, everybody agreed and it didn't get in the final bill because it was all this horse trading. Right. It was just, it's just. That, that, oh, yeah, that, that so unless you've, you've got the millions of dollars to get in there and, and influence, it's going to be hard to overcome that. Yeah, so. I, don't, I don't know if you ever heard the story of like the hamburger bill. Uh-uh. It was called the um, Personal Responsibility in Food Act, meaning that if you ate crap, it's your fault. Right. And you can't sue any food company. Oh, and you right. can't sue McDonald's right. because mm-hmm. you got fat eating McDonald's. Yeah. Right. It was called a hamburger bill. <laughs> and and in this guy, this up. <laughs> Representative Scott, who was from Florida, w- introduced this bill and it passed Congress by like a two to three, like a two two-thirds thirds. majority. Wow. Didn't get through the Senate. Yeah. Uh, although it later passed in like over 25 states with a different name, like Consumer Choice Act or something. And and it turned out that this guy got $300,000 from a PAC, a political action committee for his campaign from McDonald's and Wendy's and Burger King. Big so like, well, what are we supposed to yeah. do? You know, yeah. like, Yeah, and we don't recognize that those foods are... They are addictive. I mean, they trigger hard, biologically hardwired mechanisms that yeah. protected us in a natural environment. Like we were, pro- we're programmed to seek out calorie dense and rewarding food, you know, yeah. because that helped us survive in a natural environment. And these companies employ biohacking food scientists that know that and oh, yeah. make the products maximally addictive. They do. They do brain imaging on toddlers, yeah. toddlers yeah. to see That's how to sick impact and wrong. Yeah, it is. And so, if you care about this. Uh, and I'm writing a lot about this in my book, Food Fix. There's a there's a group called the Food Policy Action Network. Great, great and if you group. go to their website, uh, they have a list of every member of Congress and their voting record on food wow. and ag and policy issues. Yeah. So you can see who's voting for what. Yes. So yeah. Chris, thank you so much for being part of the Doctor's Pharmacy. It's been a great conversation. Uh, if you love this podcast, please share with your friends and family on social media. Leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and we'll see you next time on The Doctor's Pharmacy. Hi, everyone. It's Dr. Mark Hyman. So two quick things. Number one, thanks so much for listening to this week's podcast. It really means a lot to me. If you love the podcast, I'd really appreciate you sharing with your friends and family. Second, I want to tell you about a brand new newsletter I started called Mark's Picks. Every week, I'm going to send out a list of a few things that I've been using to take my own health to the next level. This could be books, podcasts, research that I found, supplement recommendations, recipes, or even gadgets. I use a few of those. And if you'd like to get access to this free weekly list, all you have to do is visit drhyman.com forward slash picks. That's drhyman.com forward slash picks. I'll only email you once a week, I promise, and I'll never send you anything else besides my own recommendations. So just go to drhyman.com forward slash picks, that's P-I-C-K-S, to sign up 
free today.